Byzantine Treatise on Skirmishing by Nikephoros Phocas, translated by George T. Dennis, voiced by Eleven Labs. A quick note. I have chosen to keep the Greek terms anglicized rather than trying to modify these with their correct pronunciation. Skirmishing. By the Emperor Lord Nikephoros. 1. Watch posts. How far apart they ought to be from one another. 2. Watch posts on the road and spies. 3. Enemy movements. Occupying difficult terrain in advance. 4. Making unexpected attacks on the enemy. Confronting the enemy as they are returning to their own country. 5. Controlling the water in the passes ahead of time. 6. Skirmishing tactics in single raids and estimating the number of men in one. 7. The assembling and movement of the army. Making use of merchants to go out and spy. 8. Shadowing and following an army. 9. Movement of raiding parties and following them. 10. When the raiding party separates itself from the troops following along behind. 11. Stationing the infantry on both sides in defiles. 12. A surprise attack by the enemy before the Roman forces can be mobilized. 13. Laying an ambush for the so-called mensuratores by their campsite. 14. Withdrawing the cavalry from the infantry when they are marching together. 15. Security. 16. Separating from the baggage train. 17. When the enemy ride into our country with a large force, preparing an ambush. 18. When it is necessary for the general to skirmish against the enemy from two sides. 19. The condition of the army, its armament and training. 20. While the enemy delay in our country, our army can invade theirs. 21. The siege of a fortified town. 22. Separation of half or a third of the enemy army. 23. Retreat of the enemy and occupation of the mountain passes. 24. Fighting at night. 25. Another method of occupying the road and making descent difficult. Skirmishing. By the Emperor Lord Nikephoros. Although it is our intention to set down instructions about skirmishing, we must bear in mind that they might not find much application in the eastern regions at the present time. For Christ, our true God, has greatly cut back the power and strength of the offspring of Ismael and has repelled their onslaughts. Nonetheless, in order that time, which leads us to forget what we once knew, might not completely blot out this useful knowledge, we think we ought to commit it to writing. If in the future, then, some situation should arise in which Christians need this knowledge, it will be readily available to assist those who have the responsibility of using it, as well as the entire commonwealth. We have acquired this knowledge not simply from hearing about it, but also from having been taught by a certain amount of experience. For one thing, the men who instructed and trained us in this method were the very ones, you might say, who invented it. Then, on our own, we have put it into practice and, as best we could, almost made it a part of us. This method has the following advantage. By making use of it, some commanders with only a small fighting force have achieved prodigious and truly remarkable results. Let me give an example. The entire Roman army could not find the daring or the strength to restore order at the time, when everything was working out in favor of the Cilicians and Hamdan. It was then that one of the best generals of the day, accompanied only by the men of his own theme, relying on his intelligence and experience, took action against the enemy. He laid his plans carefully, campaigned against them, and by him see if brought the situation under control. We say this not because we prefer a small fighting force to a larger one, or because we think this method is better than all other stratagems and tactical pie procedures, but because it has proven its if to be extremely helpful for the best generals. What the situation is such that they cannot confront the enemy directly, they may employ this method, and they will preserve both themselves and their country free from harm. To the best of my knowledge, it was Bardas, the blessed Caesar, who brought this method to the summit of perfection. Do not want to enumerate all the ancient commanders, but shall limit my CF to those in our own time whom everyone knows. When this method had completely vanished, it was Bardas who brought it back. When he was general in the themes bordering on Tarsus, namely Cappadocia and Anatolicon, thousands of times he inflicted harm on the forces of Tarsus and the rest of Cilicia, and gained tremendous victories over them. It was by him that L2 was trained in this method, even though L also acquired a good deal from experience. In addition to him, there was Constantine the Patrician, whose surname was Melanos. For many years he was general of Cappadocia and made regular use of this method, achieving great results. In their company belongs Lord Nikephoros, the revered emperor, who pursued this method to the highest degree. When he was the commander and used it, he accomplished a great number of admirable deeds. Thousands of times, so to speak. He routed the enemy and cut down huge armies of them. The reader might find it tiresome if we were to describe or even list his valiant deeds during the period of his command, 
since there are so very many of them and they are so well known. By putting it into practice, he realized how useful this method was and decreed that instructions on employing it should be written down for the benefit of all. He entrusted me with the task of describing the method as accurately as possible and handing it on to those who would come after us. Not only should L write about what applies in the East, but also about what should prove helpful in the West, since I spent a long time commanding troops there and acquired as much experience as L could and made it part of me. That aspect, however, will be treated separately in another place. Our purpose now is to discuss the East, so then, observing his command and relying upon the assistance of God's grace, which is always bestowed upon men of goodwill, I'll now begin with the subject. 1. Watch posts. How far apart they ought to be from one another. Commanders who have assumed responsibility for the large border themes and who have authority over the mountain passes should use every device, take every step, and never relax in their concern to labor and fight to preserve the territory of the Romans secure and unharmed from the incursions of the enemy. To this end, they should station sentries who are in good physical condition, competent, and who know the roads perfectly. If there are high and rugged mountains on the frontier with the enemy, they should place the watch posts on them. The posts for the sentries should be about three or four miles apart. When they observe the enemy moving out, they should quickly hurry off to the next station and report what they observed. In turn, those men should race off to the next station. In this way, the information will eventually reach the cavalry posts situated on more level terrain. They will then inform the general of the alien incursion. The men should spend 15 days in watching the roads, bringing enough provisions with them for that number of days. Lists of soldiers should be carefully drawn up and the men gotten ready by the officers so that replacements may be sent to relieve the men at the posts. The full complement of troops as set down in the lists must be sent out on a regular basis, and nobody should be allowed to stay at home by the officers because of shameful gain. The sentries should be on the lookout for places in which the enemy are likely to make camp. These are usually places in which the ground is level and there is plenty of water. Other men should look for places in which the roadway narrows, and still others where there is a river difficult to cross. If they guard these places carefully, the enemy will not be able to move out secretly. Trustworthy and very experienced men should be sent out to check and see if the sentries are guarding their areas carefully and without slackening. The exact number of sentries as listed should go out with none missing. They should not leave the post to which they have been assigned to observe and guard the roads. They should not stay in the same station for a long time, but should change and move to another place. Otherwise, if they are too long in the same place, they will be recognized and might easily be captured by the enemy. 2. Watch posts on the road and spies. The role played by the sentries along the roads is essential. The general must devote a good deal of attention to these also, and set up their posts in suitable locations, so that when the enemy begin to move the sentries will learn of it from the posts along the road. The general will have advanced knowledge that the enemy are moving out, and what road they plan on taking. The people in the countryside then, warned by the sentries and the expilatories, may take refuge with their animals in fortified locations. On the borders of the Armenian themes in which the Armenians may be acting as sentries, the regulations which have been enforced from ancient times should be observed, since the Armenians carry out sentry duty rather poorly and carelessly. Select and sign up qualified men as sentries, whose wages should come from the funds the army should have set aside for their services. They should receive the stipulated allowance each month. They should also be rotated each month. Their duty is to guard the roads along which the enemy may approach. But even with the salary and monthly allowance, these men are not very likely to perform the sentry duty well, for after all, they are still Armenians. We must, then, rely on spies for information about the movements of the armies. Select some good, courageous trapezites, those whom the Armenians call Tassinarioi. Enter their names onto the rolls. Set officers over them who should be courageous and who should, in addition, possess excellent first-hand knowledge of the roads and of the Syrian countryside. These men should be sent out constantly to charge down on the lands of the enemy, cause harm and ravage them. If possible, they should also capture some of the enemy and bring them back to the commanding general so that he might obtain information from them about the movements and plans of the enemy. 3. Enemy Movements Occupying Difficult Terrain in Advance Upon learning that the enemy have begun to move, the general must assemble his own troops, make sure they are armed, and proceed to the border areas. The entire infantry force should advance toward the road along which the enemy will soon move out. If he learns that only a small enemy force is riding out, he should make haste to meet up with them and have the foot soldiers together with the cavalry overwhelm them, if indeed he has been able to assemble and organize the infantry. 
Since the infantry is more suited for fighting on narrow and difficult ground, it is necessary to make use of it to occupy the mountain heights in advance and to hold on to them. If the terrain permits, infantry units should be stationed on both sides. In sectors which are also suited for cavalry action, have the horsemen join with the infantry. When the enemy hear about our preparations and that we have occupied the passes, they will either slow down their advance or with God's help, they will be beaten back. In case the ground is not suited for launching an attack from both sides, but only from one, then that elevated part ought to be occupied in advance. In places which are not suitable and which do not allow us to launch our attack from a high mountain, but in which the road rises gradually and is rough and made narrow by little streams, the infantry units must still be positioned on higher ground. They should seize the road and block it with soldiers bearing shields and javelins. Behind them should be archers, men who can throw rocks, and more slingers. Get a second line organized to stand behind the first. On both sides of the line guarding the road down the middle, station men with javelins, light-armed troops, and slingers. If they say that there are other roads, of the sort which the border guards call atropoi, off to the right or to the left of the line guarding the public road, not close by but further off, these two should be seized by the infantry and tightly guarded. Otherwise, if the enemy find out that the public road is securely held by a large number of troops, they will advance along one of those off to the side. If this should not be well and securely guarded, the enemy will use that to find a way through and will appear to the sides or the rear of our formation, injecting confusion and fear into the Roman army. But if both sides are tightly guarded, then the enemy will either charge into battle and with God's help will be put to shame or, struck with terror, they will take another road a number of days distant. The enemy will then face two problems. The first is that they will be worn out by marching for several days away from their camp and the good road. The second, which will be their ruin, is that they will be demoralized and fall into despair, while the Romans will become more daring and more eager to do battle with them. This is what happened three times in the past to Ali, the son of Hamdan, twice in the reign of the revered and thrice-blessed emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus and once in that of the good emperor Romanos, his blessed son. Virtually everyone knows all about the complete destruction of the adversaries of Christ at that time. In various sections of the defiles, the men of Tarsus and the land of Cilicia were put to headlong flight by the commanders of the time who planned everything so well. 4. Making unexpected attacks on the enemy. Confronting the enemy as they are returning to their own country. The general must make it one of his highest priorities and concerns to launch secret and unexpected attacks upon the enemy whenever possible. If he is successful in this sort of operation, with only a small group of men, he will put large numbers of the enemy to flight. If, as described above, he finds a place in the mountain passes which is suitable for fighting the enemy from both sides, he should attack without hesitation. With his troops in proper formation, and with God's help, he will force the enemy to turn to flight. Still, instead of confronting the enemy as they are on their way to invade Romania, it is in many respects more advantageous and convenient to get them as they are returning from our country to their own. They will then be worn out and much the worse for wear, after having spent such a long time in the Roman lands. They are likely to be burdened with a lot of baggage, captives, and animals. The men and their horses will be so tired that they will fall apart in a battle. They will also be in a hurry and anxious to get back to their own country rather quickly. Delaying a few days, moreover, allows time for the Roman armies to be assembled, not only from the neighboring mountain passes but also from those farther away, and in sufficient numbers and with proper equipment to be well prepared for battle. Then is the lime, as we have said, by either day or night, to fight them, and there is no doubt that we shall win. The general, therefore, must never let them return home unscathed. Getting ready to encounter the enemy in battle in the defiles as they begin their invasion is less expeditious and can be very much of a wasted effort. For one thing, it is not possible to assemble the infantry units so quickly in a few days and to see that they are properly prepared. In addition, the enemy will then be fresh, well-armed, and difficult to fight. But attacking them as they return has this advantage. It will instill in them the fear that each time they want to invade, we will occupy the passes and after a while they may cut out their constant incursions into the Roman themes. 5. Controlling the water in the passes ahead of time. In those sections of the defiles and mountain passes in which the general is preparing for combat, he should make sure that any spring of water flowing there should be occupied by his own men, so they can draw off the water from it. If there happens to be only a small amount flowing, he should make sure that it does not get muddied, which would cause serious harm to the men 
and place them in real difficulty. But if there is no spring in the vicinity to provide drink and refreshment for the troops, especially during the summer months, let him order each company to furnish ten bags and use them to carry water, so that during combat it may be distributed to the men engaged in the fighting for drink and refreshment. Enough, however, has now been said about how to go about waging war in the passes. If it should be necessary to fight at night in such difficult terrain, this can be very useful, but L shall explain about that in another chapter. Now L shall begin our discussion on skirmishing. This should prove beneficial, even essential, inasmuch as it prepares a very small number of troops to disable a large multitude of the enemy, and for the most part, with God's favor, to overwhelm them. 6. Skirmishing tactics in single raids and estimating the number of men in one. The type of enemy raid which we call a single raid sets out from their country without infantry. They usually ride along rapidly and keep going the whole night without camping anywhere, but make brief stops to rest their horses only in order to feed them. In general, these single raids start out with a very small but select body of troops. They make an effort to move most rapidly to the territory they want to raid. When the general therefore learns from the road sentries and guards that they have started out, he should move with all haste to the areas on the frontier. He should send ahead a termarch or another officer, a very experienced and competent man, with some selected junior officers and good horses. They should catch up with the enemy, keep a close and experienced eye on them, follow them along, and report back to the general if it is possible in the place they have reached to observe the number of soldiers in the party. It is not only by visual observation that one can estimate the numerical strength of the enemy. First, there are the hoof prints of the horses. For when there is a large amount of grass in a deserted area, and if it is all trampled down by the horse's feet, experienced scouts can form an approximate estimate from this of the quantity of troops. In like manner, one can examine the ground at river crossings. A more precise estimate can be formed from the enemy's camp after they have vacated it. When the general learns of the approach of an enemy raid and figures out which regions they intend to invade, then he should move closer to them. Finding a good location to conceal himself and his men, he should send out mounted scouts in all directions. When he has obtained information about them, and they have been observed riding out and scattering all over, then, while they are disorganized, he should march out after them, and he should have no difficulty in defeating them. If the enemy happen to have captured some of the local inhabitants before beginning their raid and they find out that the general is in the vicinity and has the area well scouted, they will not even dare to ride out, but without having accomplished anything and having gained only toil, wear and tear and misery they will beat a hasty retreat back to their own country. 7. The assembling and movement of the army, making use of merchants to go out and spy. He ought also to have the businessmen go out. He should pretend to make friends with the emirs who control the castles in the border regions. He should also write to them and send out men with gift baskets. As a result, with all this coming and going, the general might be able to get a clear picture of the plans and intentions of the enemy. He should find out how many men make up their army, how many horse and how many foot. He should find out about their commanders and the area in which they plan to make their attack. After receiving the report that the army has moved out and knowing their projected invasion route into Romania, then he should assemble his whole army and march toward the border. He should send out a very experienced termarch or another high-ranking, competent officer, along with picked horsemen, to intercept the enemy before they penetrate our territory. They should follow along, keeping up with them, and report their movements to the general. Eight. Shadowing and following an army. Shadowing the enemy should be done in the following manner. The general with all his troops should ride off to a good, strong location. The expilatories should get the inhabitants of the area with their animals to take refuge in the fortified towns, or, if there are none, in very strong and secure positions high up in the mountains. About the second or third hour of the day, he should send out the people who are to do the shadowing. On receiving his orders from the general, the commander should gather his troops together along with the spare horses, and ride quickly to the road along which the enemy are marching. Their baggage and the grooms for the horses should be left behind with the general. The only supplies they should bring with them are food for one day, not too much of that, only bread and cheese or some dried meat and fodder for the horses and mules. When they encamp in a village and find what they need, as well as fodder for the horses, then the commander should have his men and horses relax there until the ninth hour of the day, while watch posts are set up in higher locations. The commander of the unit ought to go into a watch post high up and personally observe and look for clouds of dust raised by the enemy and smoke. From these signs, he should be able to form an estimate of their route of march and where they are likely to camp. 
Experienced men should be able to pick out suitable camping sites. When they find the place in which the enemy have set up camp, they should immediately inform the general. He, in Tum, should set out on the road with the army under his command, and over their armor they should wear the sort of surcoat we call Epinoch Libana of a dark color, and each man should carry his weapons in his hands. After sunset, when the enemy who had left the camp for raiding are returning to their tents and the groups guarding them are posted, then they should advance and move closely to the enemy camp. They should march with deliberation and careful attention and stealthily. The commander should keep in hiding, so he will not be observed by the enemy. After nightfall, he should move closer to the encampment. If the enemy have made their camp on a high mountain, they should be able to keep them under surveillance in that place without any difficulty from either one or two areas near their camp. Two or three men should get off their horses, ascend the mountain on foot, and move close to the camp. From those high and very secure positions on the mountain, to which the enemy have no easy access, they should observe the army, listen to the voices of the troops, hear the neighing of the horses and mules. They should also send out another four units of four mounted men, each who should station themselves here and there around the camp at a distance from one another, so they too can listen to the neighing of the horses and mules and the murmuring of the troops. But if in the vicinity of the camp there is no such secure mountain, still, in the same way, send out the four four-man units to station themselves silently here and there around the camp. They can give each other special signals, either by whistling or by a spoken command, if it becomes necessary to withdraw. They should be relieved by other troops twice or at least once a night so they and their horses can get some rest. At the time of this relief, a termarch or some other high-ranking officer should inspect the location and operation of the post, and after having properly installed the new men in place of the others, he should return to his previous post. On hearing the noises which indicate that a raid is beginning, the four units of four should withdraw a little, but not too far away. They should report to the termarch that the enemy are moving out. He should then let the general know what road they have taken and at what time. If he finds out the precise time of their departure, the general should be able to guess how far they will have gotten by morning. The men dispatched by the termarch should inform the general in his encampment of the departure of the raiding party. But in case they should not find him there, but only the camp guards left behind by him, they should call out on arriving. On hearing the shouting, the guards will examine them closely, join them, and lead them quickly to the general or to yet other camp guards in case the general has moved again. For he should, once or even twice a night, change the location of his camp for the sake of good security, so they might not be ambushed by the enemy. He should have two sets of watch posts to assure his protection. 9. Movement of raiding parties and following them. Upon learning that a raiding party has begun to move, the general should immediately send out another officer with some selected cavalrymen, assigning him to the termarch who is following the raiding party. This junior officer should be accompanied by one of the men who had been sent by the termarch to inform the general of the raiding party's movement. This man should serve as a guide so he can reach the termarch more quickly. The general himself, together with his troops, should march out behind the officer he is sending and make haste to catch up with the termarch. He should then stay behind the termarch who is following the enemy raiding party. This following behind the enemy ought to be carried out with precision and without deviation, adhering to their tracks and line of march. When the enemy raiding party moves out, the termarch should pick out three teams of experienced and competent men and with them proceed to the road used by the enemy. He should give instructions to the first, second, and third teams about how they are to proceed along and follow after the enemy, then return to his own troops. The first team should march close enough to the enemy so that they hear the murmuring of men and the neighing of the horses. The second should follow along at a distance at which it can see the first team ahead of it and also be seen by it. They should get no closer than that, and not get far enough away to be out of sight. Three units of four men each should then be organized behind the three teams just mentioned. The first of these should remain in sight of the third team, the second unit of four in sight of the first. The third unit, the one following the second, should have six men, so that two of them may relay to the termarch the information uncovered by the teams. The termarch may then report it to the general. If the enemy should quicken their pace, the first team ought to pass on this information, so that the termarch and the general may quicken their own pace and not fall too far behind the enemy. If, on the other hand, the enemy should slow their march, the termarch and the general should likewise slow down in their own marching. Otherwise, they may get too close and be detected. They should not fall so far behind that they can no longer observe the operation of the units following the enemy or no longer be observed by them, which can cause serious problems. 
It is very important that the general be informed when the enemy make camp in order to feed their horses. Bet him then find a good location to set up camp and feed his own horses. He should establish guard posts out a bit to protect himself. When he is informed that the enemy have begun to move again, he should immediately set out to follow. He should send about thirty horsemen here and there around him, not far but fairly close, within hearing distance of his troops. To his near there should follow an officer with cavalrymen, a unit they call a Saka. Let the general ride along at a distance and take every precaution to avoid being discovered following behind. He should proceed very cautiously and should order the units following the enemy more closely to keep a sharp eye out in case the enemy have left some detachments behind to ambush the men following them as well as the general himself. This has been done often by the men of Tarsus. When the Termarch was following them and was not carefully looking out for streams up ahead and for places capable of concealing troops, he unexpectedly fell right into an ambush. This means that the units following must be very shrewd and careful to keep anything of this sort from happening. The general should have figured out the places and villages which the enemy planned to attack. Before dawn, then, he should angle out to either the right or the left of them, whichever appears to him as providing safer ground. Quickening his pace, he should move out from their flank about two miles. As mentioned, this should be done before daybreak, so the enemy will not see the clouds of dust and become aware of the general's presence. On reaching safe ground, the general should conceal his troops. With a few horsemen, let him draw more closely to the enemy. He should mount a high vantage point and hasten to get a good look at them. As they move out for attack and scatter for plunder, the general should remain in that spot until the third or fourth hour of the day. He should study the battle formation of the emir and form a careful estimate of the number of his men. When the troops going out to raid have gotten far enough away from the emir's battle formation so they cannot retreat to it again, or so they will not even be aware of an attack upon the formation, since each man will be rushing to get to the villages and gather as much booty as possible. Then the general should set his own battle line in proper order and launch his attack against that of the emir, now undermanned. And with the aid of God, he will be victorious and bring about the complete and utter destruction of the enemy. If he does not feel confident enough to attack the battle line directly, inasmuch as he notices that it is very strong, significantly stronger than his own, then he should move off at a distance to the side by a good, but secret, road, and with due speed reach the enemy soldiers who are dispersed about. During the whole day he should charge in upon them and fight them, as they are scattered all around, and with God on his side, he will accomplish memorable deeds. He should leave a capable officer with a few horsemen behind to keep an eye on the battle formation of the emir, and to report back to him whatever he observes there, such as if it sets out on the road. Nah. If the general should meet up with a large falcon assigned to protect the enemy as they are scattered about for plundering, he should divide his own force in two, sending on ahead one group to attack the falcon. After they have joined battle, the general, following closely with his own battle line, should immediately charge into the foe with great speed and spirit, shouts, and battle cries. With the help of God, he will tum them back, pursue them, and utterly defeat them. If therefore, with the assistance of God, the general is successful, he will overthrow the enemy who have ridden out to plunder. After he has performed such a great and noteworthy service, it is likely that the enemy will ignominiously retreat to their own country. But if they should still be thinking of spending time in our territory, the general should then assemble his own troops, move a distance from the enemy to a suitable site, and there let his weary men rest for three days. Each day he should send out only those who, as we described above, are to shadow the enemy. <laughs> when the general finds out that the enemy are beginning to retreat, he should immediately and in great haste dispatch a capable officer to mass the infantry along the difficult sections of the road. He too should hurry, allowing himself no rest by day or by night, and with great speed get in front of the enemy. After properly organizing his entire army, foot and horse, he should engage them in battle, as we have previously explained in detail. If he does it in this way, by the grace of Christ and by the power and intercession of his undefiled mother, he will be victorious in the struggle against the enemy. Enough about this now. 10. When the raiding party separates itself from the troops following along behind, should immediately, with most of his men, launch an attack as vigorously as possible on the enemy battle line. Let the rest of his men move toward the rear of the enemy and get set to join battle there. Unless our sins cause something to prevent it, they will overpower the enemy. Still, by fighting fiercely, the enemy might be able to hold their ground. They might make their stand in that very place unloading the pack animals and throwing up a sort of rampart of all the things lying around and form up for battle against us. This would cause great difficulty. 
nonetheless, the general must continue the battle against them by forming a circle. If possible, our infantry force should really rush to get there on the day of the battle so they may join in preparing this maneuver. If this is impossible because they are too far away, some of the capable horsemen should be ordered to dismount and fight the enemy on foot, along with the other horsemen, making use of bows, slings, spears, and shields. The general should have his equipment and baggage train brought up if they happen to be nearby, and should set up camp near the enemy to their consternation and despair. If there is absolutely no water in that place, this too will cause them to become demoralized. Even if he does not completely defeat them, he will nonetheless take many of them captive, very many he will kill or leave wounded, and he will destroy their warlike spirit. They will not dare launch an attack against Roman settlements again. If the general does not know in advance of their moving from one campsite to another, either as L said, through deserters or prisoners, which would give him time to send out ambushing parties at night along their route, then during the daytime, as the enemy are marching along openly, he should prepare to launch an attack against them, unless, of course, his army is absolutely too small and undermanned. An attack against the baggage train, to put it succinctly, never leads to resistance or damage to our army, for it is protected by only a few horsemen. In fact, every time we have gotten into battle with them, the army of the Romans has captured and killed large numbers of them, and has also made off with many of their pack animals and mules along with their loads. If the infantry force should arrive on the day of battle, presumably equipped and in good condition for combat, he should, as a good general, prepare an attack in a circle against them, and it should end up with their being annihilated. That this has been done against the baggage train of the enemy, as well as by them against ours, we have witnessed, read about in history hooks, and have learned from our predecessors. For these reasons, an attack on the baggage train works out well. It does not result in resistance or any damage but in victory and glory. For even if the Roman army should not be victorious in battle against it, at least it will not suffer any damage. If the enemy remain in their original campsite, reluctant to depart because the place is so strong, and they wait for the raiding party there, in like manner the general should launch his attack against them. He should not delay in order to assemble his own infantry, or on some other pretext, for the raiding party might return and forestall the attack. This is how the general should move against them. He should send out scouts to reconnoiter the surrounding settlements, especially those close to the enemy camp. Select horsemen under an experienced and courageous officer should be placed in concealment in a suitable location in the area. Then, as the enemy troops who have been out foraging for supplies come into them, they should attack. Place other horsemen in ambush to support and augment the troops sent out ahead. If the enemy horsemen should actually try to pursue these troops, they will be set upon, put to flight, and pursued. After all, the number of horsemen left behind to guard the enemy's baggage train is always very small. In case the enemy does not come into the region, so that this plan is not feasible, then let the general order those more experienced scouts, whom he had dispatched previously, to find out on what side of the camp the enemy lead the camels out to graze. Let him then detail a termarch or a suitable substitute with some courageous horsemen to look about for a stream, if a convenient one can be found in the place. Staying hidden, they should sneak along it until they get close. They should then come out and attack the camels. The troops on this mission should be divided into two parties. Half of them should take the camels and asses while they are grazing. The other half should provide protection and aggressive support for them. Even if a falcon of the enemy is stationed outside the camp and should move up against the men attacking the camels, or horsemen should ride out of the camp and pursue them, the troops left behind will engage these in battle. Then, too, the general who should not be far away but in concealment nearby should immediately move out against them. As he observes the battle which has been joined, he should so organize his forces either to charge fiercely against the enemy or, if the troops sent out are more numerous than his own people, he should keep them together in formation and make his attack against the enemy camp. Presuming that he knows the lay of the land, he should lead out all of his people, cavalry and infantry. He should assign sectors to all the units of horse and foot and then launch an attack against them, if possible, in a circle. If, as we mentioned above, there is a river or a stream which can protect the enemy in place of a rampart, and if there is some sort of ford, he should station his men there. He should be sure to have them pitch their tents to make it quite clear that they intend to camp there, which should frighten the enemy. If he makes his dispositions for battle in a good, orderly, and courageous manner, he will achieve great success. But if he should be unable to put them to flight on the first day, since they might put up a fierce resistance and be aided by an infantry force in the terrain, then he ought to remain nearby and call in more infantry. He should also get light troops and slingers to fire at them during the night, and he should light a large number of fires all around them. 
He should exhort the light troops to join in hand-to-hand -hand combat and face danger bravely and boldly until they make their way inside the enemy camp. Then at night, they can take the horses, mules, and other things, continuously striking and slaughtering the enemy. If, with God's help, this is exactly how things are going in one sector, the other units in line will see this and know what is happening. They will then rush over and, contemning death in order to seize plunder and hoping to pick up something, they will easily overcome them by the grace of Christ. If, owing to some blunders or ill fortune, his troops do not utterly defeat them, they will, nonetheless, capture and kill many of them and will take a huge amount of booty. As the general is directing operations around the enemy camp, he ought also to send a competent, experienced officer with 40 horsemen out a good distance to guard the road down which the enemy raiding party is likely to return. When he observes them riding toward their camp, moving closer to our men, as is customary with the people of Tarsus, with what they call a marine pound in front of them to announce to the troops in the camp that the raiding party is coming. The officer who had been detailed for scout duty should immediately inform the general. If he sees that the Veridan is a good distance ahead of the main body of the raiders, he should dispatch a competent officer with select horsemen to attack them if possible by surprise, and he will easily overpower them. But if the Veridan is advancing just a little bit ahead of the main body of raiders, nobody should be sent out against them. He should rather be satisfied with the help that God has given him in the battle against the enemy's army, and he should return with all his people, seizing very strong and suitable sites. When the enemy army has passed through the difficult areas and awaits the arrival of the raiding party in order to escort it through those difficult areas, and along with them, preserve intact their booty, whether this consists of captains or flocks, the general must strive to get there ahead of them and with all his men, foot and horse, occupy the passes. He will be able to direct the fighting against them all the more carefully, as has been explained above. When they turn back, they should not be allowed any respite at all from attack. If he does good work in organizing the fighting in the difficult areas, he will absolutely overwhelm them. But if, because he does not have a sufficient or worthwhile infantry force, he is unable to rout them completely, he will nonetheless rescue many, if not all, of our people who had been taken captive as well as their property. His troops will certainly wound a good number of the enemy themselves and take captives. 11. Stationing the infantry on both sides in defiles. Even if he has only a small number of troops with him, the general should make use of another method in his efforts to defeat the enemy. Let him search for a suitable and very secure location, if possible, with a fortress nearby. The natural defenses of the site should allow it to be occupied by infantry. Units of them should be concealed in ambuscades on both sides of the road. Let the general take position close behind the infantry, very, very close behind them, and with him, the cavalry units. A concealed cavalry force and the infantry should be close to him, and his own position should be almost in the rear ranks of the infantry. And up to a hundred selected men should be dispatched by the general to prepare ambushes. They should have rugged horses and be commanded by an experienced and courageous officer who knows suitable locations for hiding his men. He should occupy such a place at night and carefully hide them. At daybreak, let him go up to an observation post and observe the movements of the enemy as they march about. When he sees them riding out to plunder and searching through the villages to gather booty and money and whatever else they can find, he should hold tight until he observes them dismounting and searching through the houses in the villages. Then with sixty or seventy horsemen, his own men, obviously outnumbering the enemy, for the general's force ought to be more numerous than the enemy, B should command them to charge courageously with the full impact of cavalry upon their adversaries, and with the cooperation of God they will be successful. But if it should happen that they are pushed back by the enemy, they should bring the remaining forty horsemen into action. Prisoners should either be killed or sent on ahead, so our men can move out quickly and reach the fortified place. That officer, meanwhile, shows his experience by continuing to fight against the enemy. At times he charges into them, at times he begins to run away, and he provokes them into pursuing. If they pursue up to that place in which the infantry is concealed and some of the enemy pass right by them, then our men should charge out of their hiding places and check the pursuing enemy, who will be repelled. The enemy who do make their way through our infantry will fall right into the ambush set up by our cavalry and will be annihilated. The infantry, taking advantage of the terrain, will not allow the pursuers to pass through, but they will leave of the pursuit and all turn back without having accomplished anything, and they will have already lost their own men who had been captured. 12. A surprise attack by the enemy before the Roman forces can be mobilized. What can be done if the enemy launch a sudden concentrated attack? 
which is the sort of thing they frequently do, before the imperial forces have been assembled, and there is only that of the general, and, owing to the suddenness of their attack, he has been unable to muster all the troops of his own theme. But all he has is a very few. He sees the enemy energetically rushing about for plunder, and he also realizes that the country in which they are making their raid has not yet been evacuated, and the people have not yet taken refuge in the fortresses and strong places. He ought to dispatch the termarch of that region, or other officers, with great speed to get ahead of the enemy and, as best they can, evacuate and find refuge for the inhabitants of the villages and their flocks. When the general sees that the enemy are already planning to attack the villages at daybreak, he ought to follow behind them, as we have explained above. That same night, he should give the enemy the impression that he is getting ready for battle right then. By doing this, he might succeed in forestalling their attack and preserve the region unharmed. If there is a river on their route which is difficult to get across but the enemy are trying to cross, or if the road should narrow or become very rough, then when most of the enemy have crossed over the river or passed through the narrow place, the general should send his troops out behind them. He himself should advance with selected officers and good horsemen and give the enemy the impression that he has been making preparations to fight against them in order to launch an attack. He should send away the grooms and foragers to a strong place or fortress, if there is one in the vicinity. If there is no river or rough ground along the road, he should still expose himself a bit and advance as though to fight until he is pursued by them at night. In this way, the enemy will be very much aware that the general is following them, and they will hold back and will not dare ride out at all and attack the villages. By such procedures, he will save the villagers from impending assault and from captivity, and they shall keep their freedom. With great precision and foresight, let him make his appearance and charge against them with a few selected horsemen, as we have said. These will immediately turn tail and retreat to the strong place and the general. They should not make such charges against the enemy too often or more than is necessary, for the troops could perhaps be taxed beyond their strength and fairly soon perish needlessly at the hands of the enemy. They have to be especially careful on nights when the moon is bright, but on moonless, dark nights they will be able to carry out these operations without injury. They will surely achieve either of two results. Either they will have made sure that the enemy do not ride out to plunder at all, or, if they should actually go out, in no way will they deign to do so before full daylight, and then only a few will go. Most of them, suspecting that the general will attack, will not leave the emir's battle formation. While the general is doing all this, the villagers may escape to the strong places and fortresses and be preserved from harm. 13. Laying an ambush for the so-called mensuratores by their campsite. When the enemy are ravaging our country without breaking their military formation, and not sending their raiding parties out to any great distance, but playing it very safe, then the general will have to devise other ways of injuring them. You ought to reconnoiter and form an estimate of the place in which the enemy's camp is presently located, and the place in which they are likely to set up camp the next day. If the distance from the present camp is very long, say 16 miles or further, so that the length of the road is quite likely to wear out both them and their horses, then investigate the ground in the vicinity of the place in which they will probably encamp. Find a good place for an ambush, carefully pick out 300 or fewer combat-ready horsemen, and conceal them there. You should set up another ambuscade with all of your people in a suitable location that is protected by some fortifications. If there is also a fortress in the vicinity, this will be a big help and will greatly increase your security. If foot soldiers are needed, have them come from the fortress to assist you in the fighting. The enemy usually send an advance party of troops, whom the Romans generally call mensuratores, ahead to the site to get the camp arranged for them. While they are engaged in this, have the soldiers whom you had earlier stationed in the first ambuscade near their camp charge out fiercely with great force, and with the help of God, you will subdue them. Even if the enemy should pursue them to the place in which you have stationed your strong ambush force, then with a noble, brave charge you will assail and overpower the pursuers and gain a memorable victory. Even if it happens that enemy forces arrive to fight against you, you will have the support of the fortifications and the infantry, and so you will put them to shame. You will force them to retreat without having accomplished anything and having lost many of their own men. 14. Withdrawing the cavalry from the infantry when they are marching together. It is your duty, General, to search very carefully for the enemy who are making a serious effort to avoid you so they can send out their raiding parties to plunder our lands. Your mind must be alert so that no plan or trick of theirs will ever get by you. For what El am now going to discuss has also been done by the enemy in other places. 
when both cavalry and infantry are marching along together with their bag gauge. Those who are planning to ride out raiding do what they have been doing the last few days. Toward sunset their baggage, all the camp servants and the infantry units, along with the warriors on horseback who have been left behind to guard them, all pitch their tents and make camp as they usually do. The men preparing for the raid and getting set to ride roughshod over our country race out to raid around early evening, so their presence will not be betrayed by a cloud of dust. The officer, then, whose duty it is to keep the enemy camp under surveillance, whether he be a termarch or of some other rank, should, with his men, approach the place in which they are encamped. At nightfall they ought to move in as usual and get close to their tents after the first or second hour of night. If they do not find the enemy horsemen in the camp because they have already gone out raiding, the only way in which the officers entrusted with this type of scouting are able to make an accurate determination and a truthful report to the general is that which I am about to explain. The men assigned to this scouting of the enemy army at close range should be grouped in units of four, as described above. Those who are to do the scouting each day should take two men, very experienced and courageous, from those whom the general has detailed to do the scouting on previous days. These should be thoroughly informed by those about what they accomplished and observed the previous day. The termarch should assign these two to one of the four units of four and send them out, in keeping with the regulations for shadowing previously set forth. They should get close enough to the camp to hear the voices of the men and the neighing of the horses. The two men who had been scouting the army in other camps when all of their people were in camp together will be able to form an estimate from the commotion and murmuring of the men, the neighing of the horses, and the area in which the raiders had pitched their tents. It will be seen that the place does not have a third of the space which the men had in their previous campsites when all the enemy troops were camping together. From this, it is possible to form a good estimate of the number of enemy troops who are missing in that place and who are no longer with those in the camp. How would it be possible not to get a good estimate when 6,000 men, more or less, and their horses, up to 12,000, are missing from the camp, all of whom the previous scouts had observed together and so made their estimate? Still, to resolve any doubt that these scouts might not have gotten a sure grasp of the facts of the situation, the termarch who has been dispatched to the scouting party should also take the following steps. He should select eight good horsemen, very experienced, and with excellent practical knowledge of the roads. They should be separated, either on the right or the left, from those in the tear, among whom the termarch is stationed. They should get in front of the enemy, staying about half a mile away from their tents. Once they have gotten in front of them, they should carefully investigate and examine the roads very closely. If indeed, enemy horsemen have ridden by, numbering up to 200, our scouts will realize that these men who have passed by are by no means the estimated 12,000 or so horses. For the scouts would surely notice the tracks of so many horses if they had recently passed by. With all due speed, they will return to the termarch to inform him of this, and along which road they made their advance. The termarch should immediately and in great haste report this to the general and tell him which road they were riding along. The general ought to consult about all this with the other commanders with him, and with other experienced men. Ah. If the general sees that his own army is strong enough to face up to the enemy's army, let him get ready to fight against them, at least if his infantry force is close by and can join up with him that same day. Now, if the place in which the enemy are encamped is protected by a fortification or a stream which is difficult to cross, he should not prepare to attack them. But if the ground is level all around, and especially if the infantry can also get there on the day of battle, let him prepare to fight. If the place is fortified, as we said, and the infantry units are missing, he should rush with great speed to overtake Dai enemy raiding party. He should also send out a good officer to take up the tracks of the enemy who have been racing along to keep the raid going quickly. He himself, with all his troops, should march rapidly off to the side, hurrying the march to get closer depending on how well he knows the roads on which the enemy is marching. He should advance with caution. At daybreak, the general should send out scouts to spy on the enemy. They should ascend some high mountains and make a good effort to observe them. During the day, the general should conceal his men so that the enemy will not see the cloud of dust they would raise, which might lead them to ambush him instead. After the men following the raiding party or the scouts sent out to observe report back to the general, the location of the enemy battle formation which includes their commander, the general takes a few men with him and goes up to a high observation post and makes it a point to study the enemy battle line with his own eyes. After observing it, since many of their people would be scattered about plundering, he and his staff should estimate the size of the enemy battle line and the strength of his own troops. If his own army is more numerous than that of the enemy, let him attack it, as we have stipulated above. 
if God grants him help and he is able to inflict damage upon their line and put them to flight, he will accomplish a great and memorable deed. If there is a large number of troops in the enemy battle formation, the general should hasten to get in front of them, in those villages in which the enemy had made their attacks, that is, from their rear. Finding them scattered about, and with both themselves and their horses worn out from the riding, he should have little difficulty in beating them down and chasing them through the villages throughout the day. He will make prisoners of them and do with them as he wishes. He will free the farmers from captivity together with any property they might have taken from them. If he should meet up with a falcon following along to protect the raiders, he should be prepared for battle against it, as we have set forth earlier, and with the help of God, he will win the battle against them. Suppose the men assigned to keep a watch on the enemy during that night should run into some obstacles. Perhaps they have not yet caught up with them, or reached a place from which they could observe the enemy camp and hear the voices of the men. Perhaps, as we said, the raiding party had gone out ahead in order to obtain accurate and factual intelligence about the army. Problems such as these slowed them down and caused them to delay in reporting accurately about the matter to the general. Now, if at the ninth hour of the night or later the general should be informed about this, and he sees that the time is short, since the enemy raiding party made its move the previous day, while it was still light and should have gotten a good distance away during the night, and it would not be possible to overtake them while they were scattered about, then he has to prepare to attack the main army. If they should plan to spend the whole day in the place in which they are encamped, he should make ready to fight against them, as we explained above in discussing launching an attack against an army. But they might not spend the day in the same place, because they are in very much of a hurry to get together with their cavalry forces, who have gone out to plunder. As they are riding along, and the general runs into them, he should energetically launch an attack against them, as we have already said in treating of the separation of the raiding party from the army on the march. If the general carries everything out carefully according to the above program, with the help of God and his holy and undefiled mother and Theotokos, he will perform a great and noteworthy service. 15. Security you must, General, make use of thorough security measures and be watchful so you do not fall victim to a surprise attack or let the enemy succeed in coming upon you unexpectedly. You will have security and protection if each day you send out men to observe the enemy army closely in their campsite. For the enemy it is a matter of great importance, and they will make use of every device to assail you when you do not expect it, so that they may overwhelm you, to the harm and destruction of the people of Christ, the dishonor of the mighty Romans and the exultation and swollen pride of the arrogant sons of Hagar, who deny Christ our God. It could happen that they might learn from some of our men whom they have taken prisoner, or who have even deserted to them, the place in which you are camped. Now, to prevent them from assembling their cavalry forces and riding out at night to reach you and fall upon you unexpectedly, when your scouts perceive the commotion among the enemy troops as they get ready to move, they must immediately and with great speed report that the troops are all stirred up to move. Again, when they do move out and begin their march along one of the roads, they should once more report the number of troops that has moved out and which road they are marching along, whether it be the whole army including the infantry or the cavalry alone. The general should not rely only on reports coming to him from the scouts close to the enemy, but he should also set up double watches, outside and inside watches, and sometimes triple watches. They should guard the roads at night and the places in which he suspects the enemy may move up. Then, during the day, not only shall he have sentries guard the road, but also go up to very high places, so they may have a better view of the smoke and clouds of dust, and especially if the enemy troops are coming. The reason why we stated that there should be several watches is that in case the first one happens to be captured by the enemy, the next one, on seeing them, can inform the general of the approach of the enemy. The general should change camps twice during the night and likewise during the day. When he changes camp, let him take the sentries with him. In the place in which he had been camping, let him leave behind six or eight men with a good officer, who are known as the reception party. When the men who are scouting close to the enemy, then bring in their reports, on arriving there, they will be shown the way to the general. When the general establishes himself in a new camp, he should detail outside guards. There should be about four men in each post, so that when two are sleeping at night, two can be on watch. 16. Separating from the baggage train. You must be sure to observe this, general. When you're getting close to the enemy, you should separate the baggage train and send it far off to a fortified place or a fortress. Name a competent and experienced man to be in charge and to be responsible for it. 
This commander of the baggage train should also be provided with a few combat-ready horsemen to augment the guards assigned to protect the train. When you need it again, inform the officer entrusted with its responsibility, so he may come to join you in a designated place. After the baggage train has separated from you, you should gather provisions for the troops and fodder for the horses, enough for two or three days, and have them transported on fast mules or in saddlebags on the horses. When you intend following a raiding party of the enemy at night, the entire fighting force should have its armor on, and each man should have his proper weapon in hand ready for battle. Be sure, moreover, to have the so-called Sokka following along behind you. Now, if the enemy's mule takes them through difficult terrain, then each theme, or even Tagma, if present, ought to march separately. The general ought to go on ahead, but behind the Termarch who is following the enemy a good distance further on. In this manner, then, the test of the force, whether they be from the themes or Tagmatic, should follow along one after the other, and they will march smoothly during the night without noise or confusion. Orders should be given to the Termarch following the raiding party to be very cautious, in fact, to be overly cautious and alert, so that if the enemy ever perceive that they are being followed by you, they might have picked fighting men, more than the Termarch has under his command, move out and hide themselves in an ambush and unexpectedly attack you. We remember an ambush of this sort made by the people of Tarsus in the villages further on. The general at that time observed clouds of dust from the troops riding out to plunder. But it was not a real raiding party, only a simulated one composed of a few worthless men. He pressed on to attack them, but the Termarch following the raiding party had been negligent and had not done a good job of looking out for ambushes. And quite unawares, the general fell right into one. <laughs> to prevent anything of this sort happening to you, general, you must take every precaution. Have some cavalrymen with swift horses and who thoroughly know the region investigate the hollows and other hiding places in the area. About daybreak, divide the army in two if it is large and numbers up to three thousand. Send the grooms and the men carrying the fodder for the horses away to a strong place. In the event of unexpected ambushes laid by the enemy, the battle formation ought to be set up in the following manner. Let the first have as its commander one of the more outstanding generals and a third of the troops in your army, and he should march behind the Termarch. You follow the first with the main part of the formation, keeping the Sokka following behind you with a few horsemen. If it happens that the enemy lie in wait for you and station large numbers of their fighting men in ambuscades and attack the Termarch following them, the first formation, the one marching ahead of you, will come to his support. Then when battle has been joined with them, the enemy becomes scattered about in the fighting and break ranks. When you find them dispersed like this, you will overwhelm them. But when the enemy have not prepared themselves for an ambush of this sort, and are anxious only to ride out and ravage the countryside, then before dawn you should conceal the units of your army in places where they will not be visible to the enemy. They should stay in these ambuscades until the third or fourth hour of the day, until the enemy have ridden out to plunder. Once they are a good distance away from the Emir's battle formation, in which there are only a few men left, not many at all, then attack it. First send out three formations of equal size to begin the onslaught. You should remain with the other three or four formations following closely along behind the first three. When these three begin the fighting in close, as you see your own men struggling, so you should provide support. First of all, have the formations following along on either side of you advance to join battle with the enemy, attacking if possible from the wings and the flank and fight hand to hand. Then if necessary, you yourself should attack if your troops are not in fact proving the stronger. Actually though, with only a few troops, as we said, left in the Emir's battle line, it will not be able to make a stand against your army which numbers about 3,000. All this we are setting forth as experience teaches. It is up to you to apply it to circumstances and the urgent needs of the time. For tradition alone does not do it, but it must be reinforced by the assistance of God, and only then will the outcome of the battle be assured. If you are present with only your own theme, General, and the force under your command is a small one, then you should follow the raiding party of the enemy cautiously at a good distance, to avoid being detected by them. You should launch your attacks only against those charging into the villages and spreading about, as explained above. 17. When the enemy ride into our country with a large force, preparing an ambush, if the entire enemy army, cavalry and infantry, gets together and with great and heavy force breaks out into our country, riding about and plundering, and if it is planning to penetrate more deeply and search around more thoroughly, and if it should happen that the Roman Ami has been gathering at about the same time, and the enemy are made to hear about its presence, they will exercise great caution with their troops, not allowing any of them to scatter about in the villages without protection. 
They will then devise ways of setting up ambushes against our own people and will strive to take them by surprise, pursue, and overwhelm them. For your part, you have to display the utmost caution so that you will not be caught by surprise by them. And in Tum, you must devise countermeasures to defeat them. You will accomplish something noble and memorable. Once they have been injured by you, in no way will they spend time plundering our lands. It is your task, therefore, to reconnoiter likely locations in which the invading enemy will ride in search of food and booty. Station mounted ambuscades in those places, all set to charge out against them. Let the number of horsemen assigned to the ambush be over 200, and their commander should be brave and have a great deal of experience with ambushes of this sort. The commander of the whole army who has five or six thousand warlike horsemen and the assistance of God will not need anything more. This army should be divided in two. 2,000 should be stationed further ahead in a suitable ambuscade that has a high observation post with a good view, so he can see his men far o being pursued and pursuing. Behind the 2,000 should be the 3,000, and the infantry units with them ought to be posted in a concealed place, which has some natural protection, as an ambush, if there happens to be a fortified town nearby that will be helpful to him. But even if the general is attacked by a large number of the enemy and the fighting becomes fierce, he should never even drink of getting inside the fortified town before he has seen to the safety of his own people, for that would not only be dishonorable and despicable, but would lead to damage and the devastation and utter destruction of the country. But if he has fallen into serious trouble, then outside in the strong places near the fortress, he and his infantry should fight back strenuously. He should be greatly helped by the terrain, and he also has the support of the foot soldiers in the fortified town. The commander, then, of the three hundred men who had been dispatched to guard the villages, may stand in an observation post and see the enemy riding into the villages. When they dismount and start searching through the houses of the villagers, then he should take a few more than a hundred out of his three hundred men and send them off with orders to attack the enemy vigorously. The men sent on this mission should outnumber the enemy raiding the village. They should fall upon them, and, by the favor of Christ, they should kill many and take many prisoners. Those of the enemy who have been able to get back on their own horses will take to flight. The rest of our men should then carefully pursue them until they are chased by the units of the enemy posted to protect their comrades. If our man commanding the 300 notices that those pursuers are not numerous and are carrying out the pursuit in a disorderly and undisciplined manner, then he should wait in the hiding places until his own men who are being chased arrive and pass by. Then he should ride out fiercely from the hiding place and, with his troops, charge upon them, and by the power and favor of Christ, he will be successful. He will take prisoners, and he will kill and wound many of the enemy. Should more of the enemy arrive and their numbers keep increasing, and should they carry out their pursuit more vigorously, then he ought to send the prisoners he has taken, along with their horses and weapons, on ahead to the place where the general is stationed. In good order, then, he and his men should withdraw, provoking the enemy to chase them and skillfully drawing them along. None of his people should know the places in which the general is lying in ambush, but only the commander. Should a large number of the enemy attack him, and should their pursuit be disorderly, he should have some of his men, brave, outstanding, and with vigorous horses, wheel about and strike the pursuers. This will allow him to get his own wounded to safety, and let the men whose horses have become weary or wounded mount others. Then, giving rein to their horses, they ride faster to put a little more distance between themselves and their pursuers. In this way they obtain a little relief from the constant pressure of the enemy on them. The enemy, for their part, will spur their horses on in pursuit, which will only make them weary and faint. Then, as our people who are being pursued approach the ambuscade, let them pass to the right or the left, so that when the men in ambush charge out at that place they will not run into them and end up injuring one another. After this, the troops being pursued should join with those in the ambush and wheel around. Having the attack against the enemy come from two sides will obviously be to the advantage of our army. Let the site of the ambush be such as to provide a good hiding place for our soldiers. The exit must not be narrow at all or the ground rough but level and broad, so nothing will obstruct their charge and swift attack against the enemy. This is particularly important if about 2,000 men are involved. For so many men, the exit in such a place has to be wide and straight. The observation post in which the commander of the troops in the ambuscade is stationed should be suitable for observing the enemy in pursuit at a great distance, estimating the number of their troops, and studying the way in which they are making the pursuit. When they come close to the ambuscade, then our men invoke the aid of God and with shouts and war cries charge out with great force, speed and courage against them. 
Our men who were being pursued wheel about so that the enemy are attacked from two sides, which is clearly to the advantage of our army. If everything is carried out in accord with the present instructions and, most important, with the assistance of God, then the enemy will be overthrown and destroyed. Anyone with experience in these matters knows this. For with the horses worn out from a long and intensive pursuit and the men so fatigued from the strenuous labor of fighting, how can they possibly avoid the worst of evils? But if, and we certainly do not hope for it, the enemy are strong enough to hold their ground and bring all their strength to bear in such a struggle, and the battle keeps going as they fight with their whole army, trying to come back from defeat, which would be contrary to our plans. The commander of the army must by some sort of prearranged signal or command or by the trumpet sounding retreat withdraw his own men from the close fighting, have them tum their backs, but not in haste or in disorderly flight, but in good order, and so provoke the enemy to pursuit. Then, as the enemy lines press on chasing them, they will fall right into the larger ambush. Our men who are being pursued should, as we said, ride by on one side of the hiding place. Then, when the troops in the large ambuscade charge out, our men being pursued should immediately wheel about, and they will find themselves battling the enemy from two sides. This will, of course, prove greatly advantageous to our army. If the pursuers, therefore, get as far as the ambush and unexpectedly fall right into it, and our troops charge out from the hiding place boldly and bravely against them, then, by the favor of Christ, they will utterly defeat them and will achieve great glory for themselves. But if some blunders keep them from completely overcoming the battle formations of the enemy, since they might have a very strong force and their whole army might be battling fiercely, yet if you have an infantry force fighting along with you, it is you who will prevail over them. Even if they are not utterly defeated nonetheless, you will put many of them to the sword, more of them you will hold as captives, and they will be bowled over by great fear and terror. The result will be that they will never dare to ride through and ravage our lands with impunity. They will instead be in a hurry to get back to their own land. In conclusion then, we have done our part by writing down these things just as our predecessors handed them on to us, as well as from our own experience, which goes back a long time. It is up to you now to apply it to the circumstances that are likely to arise. The outcome of war is not brought about according to the will of men, but just as the affairs of each one are weighed by the providence of God on high. 18. When it is necessary for the general to skirmish against the enemy from two sides. If the enemy are still around, which one would not expect after they have been so severely mauled, and if they are wandering about our country in organized bands, burning things down and destroying but not at all daring to send their men out to any distance for raiding, then the general ought to send a sizable force to the other side of the enemy, the side on which he is not marching. When some of the enemy ride by about three or four miles from their army, this detachment should attack and harass them here and there in order to prevent them from gathering food. When food becomes scarce, they may be compelled to turn back. If you notice, General, the enemy still on their guard, not allowing their men to ride out very far to gather food, then you must make plans for an ambush to hurt them. Find out about the falcons of the enemy which have gone out to guard them and which are stationed far from the camp. Observe which one of them is slower in returning to their tents, perhaps just taking their time until their comrades who have been searching out the nearby villages should return to their tents, then make haste to ambush them. Have experienced scouts estimate, if they can, the number of enemy troops in the falcon. Select a larger number than these of brave horsemen, and prepare an ambush for the enemy, appointing it brave and very experienced man as commander. Have him order a few of the men under him to dress like farmers, and mix in some real farmers and herdsmen with them. All of them ought to be unarmed and their heads uncovered. Some should be barefoot. All should be on horseback, carrying very short wooden staffs. Do all this to deceive the enemy, and to give them the impression that these men are not from the army, but just some farmers of the sort called stewards. There should not be more than twenty of them. They should go into six or more villages close to one another, in which they have some herds, whether beasts of burden, cattle, horses, or mules. About the eleventh hour of the day, order them to let themselves be seen by the enemy, going from one village to the other on the run and moving about as though they were rounding up their animals and conveying them to safety in strong places. Now then, when the men forming the falcon see these people, some of them leading their herds along, others driving them off, they will surmise that they are peasants and farmers and will follow them, relaxed and off guard. Our men then, who are disguised as farmers and peasant stewards, when the enemy have begun to follow them, should hurry to reach the site of the ambuscade. There the enemy who are following them, caught off their guard, will fall right into the ambush. 
When they draw near, the men waiting in ambush should charge out vigorously and in good order against them and fall upon them. It is clear that the enemy will not stand up against them, not even for a little while. But they will tum tail, and many of them will be killed or taken captive. <laughs> if the place in which all this happened is near the enemy army, and a number of their soldiers should ride out to avenge the troops who have been defeated, the general should have more men stationed in a good spot for an ambush behind the first ambushing party, two miles away from it. If indeed, as we said, the enemy force should pursue the troops in the first ambush, those in the second ambush, riding out against them, will come to the rescue of their own men and will slaughter and inflict serious injury upon the enemy. You ought to employ such a trick, General, around sunset, so that if large numbers of the enemy attack the men in the ambush, nightfall will break up the battle and you will preserve the men under your command unharmed. 19. The condition of the army, its armament and training. If they should dare to dispatch a raiding party, you must get set to deal with it in a suitable manner. Send out one of the men in your command, one noted for his courage and experience, with a sufficient number of well-armed troops. Have them swoop down upon the enemy while they are scattered about, slay some, and take others captive. But by all means never break up your formation, if you happen to run into very large enemy falcons, who are, of course, following along to protect the mounted enemy raiders. Keep your own formation tightly drawn up and join battle with the falcon, relying on sound strategy and experience as we have explained. You will beat them down and effect their complete destruction. We are recalling these matters, General, for your protection and that of your men. If the army under your command is really quite small and very much inferior to that of the enemy, if the fighting men under you number about five or six thousand, then you should hasten to draw them up in formation directly facing the enemy. Make use then of devices, stratagems, special operations, and, when necessary, surprise attacks against them. If you call upon your experience and thoroughly plan your warfare against them, with the invincible assistance of Christ our God as a protection, you will achieve great victorious triumphs over the enemy. There is no other possible way, as far as strategy and experience are concerned, for you to prepare for warfare except by first exercising and training the army under your command. You must accustom them to and train them in the handling of weapons and get them to endure bitter and wearisome tasks and labors. They should not be allowed to become slack or lazy or to give themselves completely to drunkenness, luxury, or other kinds of debauchery. They certainly ought to receive their salaries and money for provisions regularly, as well as gifts and bonuses, more than are customary or stipulated, not lacking anything. Therefore, they will be able to use these to obtain the best horses and the rest of their equipment. With a joyous spirit and a willing and exultant heart, they will choose to brave dangers on behalf of our holy emperors and all the Christian people. But what is more important than all else and more basic, what arouses their enthusiasm, increases their courage, and incites them to dare what nobody else would dare, is the fact that their own households and those of the soldiers sowing them and everyone about them possess complete freedom. This has provided them security and protection from the beginning and from antiquity. You will find that this has been legislated by the holy and blessed emperors of old and is written down in the tactical books. In addition to freedom, though, they should enjoy proper respect and not be despised and dishonored. Nope. For I am ashamed to say men such as these are beaten, men who do not value their own lives above service to the holy emperors, and for the freedom and vindication of Christianity. And these things are done by tribute-levying mannequins who contribute absolutely nothing to the common good, but whose sole intent is to wear down and squeeze dry the poor, and from their injustice and abundant shedding of the blood of the poor, they store up many talents of gold. These men ought not to be dishonored by the thematic judges either, dragged off as prisoners and whipped, bound in chains and, oh, what a terrible thing, pilloried. Yet these are the defenders and, after God, the saviors of Christians who, so to speak, die each day on behalf of the holy emperors. The law itself stipulates that each officer has authority over his own men and can judge them. Does anyone else have authority over the men who live in the theme beside the general alone, whom the holy emperor has appointed? For this reason, from the most ancient Romans and from the law, the general possesses authority over his own theme. He judges cases in matters that affect the soldiers, and he manages affairs that come up in the theme. He has a judge to cooperate with him and with whom he too cooperates. He also cooperates with the protonotary and the others assigned to public service. The term arch, as is clear from the law and imperial decrees, has also had authority to judge in his own terma, according to the regulations in force and their precedents. If, in conclusion, the army of the holy emperors should attain its ancient condition and can rid itself of those elements dragging its men into poverty, 
they will be full of enthusiasm, happiness, and good cheer. They will be better soldiers and more courageous, and will appear to the enemy as absolutely invincible. When this comes to pass, our holy emperors will not only defend their own lands, but will make many other lands of the enemy subject to themselves. 20. While the enemy delay in our country, our army can invade theirs. When large numbers of the enemy wander about our country ravaging, destroying, and making plans to besiege fortified places, they will indeed be on their guard to avoid being ambushed by the Roman units. In fact, they will be devising plans to ambush us. If a Roman army, large enough and capable of defeating them, is not there to confront them, then you, General, must take action such as was taken in the past, and which is described in the strategical book, composed by the revered and most wise Emperor Leo. Those who have read it will understand clearly what we shall be discussing. About that time, all the men of Cilicia, a huge force, invaded the theme of Anatolicon and were vigorously besieging the fortified town of Mistheia. The Emperor ordered the commander of the army at that time to take thematic and tagmatic units and campaign down in the country of the Cilicians. Two generals, the one of Anatolicon and the one of Opsicion, were left behind to confront the enemy and defend the fortified town and the rest of the country as best they could. Now, the supreme commander of the armies, Nikephoros Phocas made his invasion along the road called after Morianos against the country of Adana and took huge amounts of plunder. The garrison of Adana came out to confront this army and about two miles outside their city formed for battle. As soon as they fell upon one another, the sons of Ismael turned tail in disorderly flight, immediately scattered and rushed back to the city. The commander of the Roman armies cut down with the sword or led into slavery all the Lismalites he found who had been unable to get inside the gates. He set up camp there near the town, chopped down vines, trees, and everything that bore fruit, and raised the elegant and beautiful suburbs. The next day, his army drove onto the sea, taking a very large number of captives and many flocks. They marched all day to the Kinyon River, which is called Hyrax locally. The army encamped beyond the bridge over which the road to Adana runs. The day after that, they left there and began the return journey to his own country. When the enemy now abandoned their siege, and with great speed, turned back to defend their own land. But they failed and gained nothing in both places. For the commander of the Roman divisions, with a large amount of spoils, booty, and prisoners, returned to the abode of the Romans along the road called Caridion. Long ago, moreover, when the men of Tarsus were attacking Roman territory, the men who then commanded Anatolicon and Cappadocia sometimes took another road and went out among the villages by themselves and other times dispatched some of their troops, and caused as much injury to them as they could. <laughs> then there was the man who had been entrusted with the command of Lakandos and of the frontier themes there at the same time. Every time that Ali the son of Hamdan would invade Romania, this commander, even when pressured by dire necessity in his own country, left there and attacked the country around Aleppo and Antioch, and did a great deal of damage. He took captive some of Ali's kinsmen and some great and illustrious leaders of his armies as well as numbers of their fighting men and many fortresses. He did the same thing in the country of Cilicia, which borders on Lycandos. Therefore, General, when you are at a loss about how to injure the enemy with stratagems and ambushes, because they are very cautious and guard themselves carefully, or if, on the other hand, it is because your forces are not up to facing them openly in battle, then this is what you ought to do. Either you march quickly against the lands of the enemy, leaving the most responsible of the other generals behind, with enough troops for skirmishing and for the security of the themes. Or else, if you carry out the skirmishing, then send your best general, well known and esteemed for his courage and vast experience, with a significant force of cavalry and infantry down to the country of the enemy. He should stay there a while, burning, destroying, besieging fortified towns. When the enemy hear of this, they will force their leader, even if he is unwilling, to get back to defend their own country. If you evacuate the area well and find refuge for the inhabitants and their flocks on high and rugged mountains, then if the enemy want to investigate and search about those mountains to take them captive, and if they intend to move close with their whole army to such an area and pitch their tents there, then you ought to draw close to that region to defend your own people. Now, if you notice that the spot in which the enemy have encamped has a mountain or high ground from which you can attack them at night, then you should make plans for this. Thoroughly investigate the lay of the land and take advantage of it. Then make ready your night attack with your infantry force and the cavalry, as explained below in the section on night fighting. You will seriously injure them, terrify them, and cause them to withdraw from there. But if they still manage to hold on in that place, 
owing to good security and keeping on guard. And if they still want to search around the mountains in which the local people have taken refuge, then the roads into the area must be taken beforehand and protected by javelin throwers and light troops, with those places well guarded which have become the refuge for the farmers with their families and children. Then, if the enemy should decide to advance along those narrow and rugged roads, they will be defeated, especially if an infantry force is sent against them. But if they want to attack with their own infantry and search about the mountains, then make haste to lead the inhabitants of the villages to more remote, stronger, and more defensible places. You then take all your men, occupy the roads leading to them, and guard them securely. 21. The Siege of a Fortified Town On learning that the enemy are getting ready to besiege a fortified town, General, you ought to determine which ones are open to a siege, for many fortified towns have no reason to fear a siege. In places subject to a siege, before the approach of the enemy, you should make sure that each person who seeks refuge in the place puts aside enough food for four months, more if possible, depending on your estimate of the duration of the siege. Take care that there is water in the cisterns and that everything else is there, which can aid and protect people under siege. Since there are so many points to consider, we will dispense with exposing them in detail in the present treatise. Matters such as these and other devices used in sieges, and how the people inside should fight against those outside, have been carefully and precisely explained before us by the authors of books on tactics and strategy. But we have been commanded to discuss skirmishing and the holding of the mountain passes. To the best of our ability, then, we shall concentrate on setting forth what is useful and conducive to that end. The enemy, therefore, surround the fortified town and prepare to begin the siege. As is usually done by those who want to reduce the besieged to dire straits, they will obviously camp in a circle around the town to prevent any of our people from entering or leaving. Since most of our fortified towns are built in strong, rugged locations, they will set up camp out there, neglecting security or fortifications. You will easily be able, General, to have your infantry force attack them in one sector at night. At the same time, at a prearranged signal, the men inside the fort should charge out. Taking advantage of the terrain, you should be ready in that very hour to engage them in battle, if possible, and you will defeat them, which, of course, should be attributed to God's providence. But if the rough and difficult nature of the ground keeps them from setting up their camp scattered about in a circle, and the entire army encamps on either one or two sides, then the first thing you ought to do is completely destroy and put to the torch all the food for men and horses, so that no necessities are left for them either near the fortified town or further away in the villages. If the area is not mountainous and wood is lacking, then bum down the very roofs of the houses. For if the enemy are in need of wood and are short of food, their people will be forced to go out further away to gather necessities. Putting your military experience to good use then, you should be able to cause them harm by ambushes and put them to flight. The result should be that the scarcity of food will compel them to lift the siege. But if you notice that they are sticking with it and keeping up the siege and that the people in the city are in more difficult straits, then you should come to regular night battles with a combined army of infantry and cavalry. Draw them up in conformity with the nature of the ground and make ready to attack at night in the manner Eliel shall explain later on in treating of night fighting. By doing this you will defeat them and will force them to abandon the siege of the fortified town. If some reason prevents the attack at night and the people inside under siege are in need of reinforcements but have no shortage of food, you should be able to get additional men through to them as well as food if they need some by the following method. Assemble the entire force under your command and divide it in two. In one half, let each man take about four sacks of grain upon the horses they are riding, providing them also with unloaded horses. They should not carry any weapons except what they need to defend themselves. With the rest of your fighting men you should get to the other side by the hour that the men carrying the grain are getting close to the fortified town. About midnight let out one loud shout and a blast of trumpets as though you were attacking them right then. While they are getting set to fight against you and rushing to attack you, the men carrying the grain will find they are safe and will convey it into the town and will be able to return unharmed. By this device, you will provide them with reinforcements and food, if they should be in need of both, and the besieged will obtain deliverance. 22. Separation of half or a third of the enemy army. If the enemy should not be getting ready to besiege a fortified town, but are wandering around our country in large numbers, then the commander of the Roman forces should make careful preparations and give orders to the farmers or the citizens of the villages to take refuge along with everything they have in fortified and strong places. As an intelligent and alert commander, he should ceaselessly inflict damage on the enemy when they come out to plunder. 
as a result they should be afraid to ride out far from their own army to obtain food this will cause them to be very hard pressed for food yet as we said since they have a large force perhaps they will try to use another method sometimes they divide their army in two or even in three sections and send one out as far as a day's march or even further and while away from their camp they stay in some villages in which they hope to find a greater supply of provisions they may have to remain outside their camp for two or even three days at any rate general when you get all this information then after thoroughly studying the situation you should lie in wait for them move up close to them at night and find a suitable place to conceal your own army since it is not just in two or three settlements that they are foraging for food but are scattered about in several more then it is likely that the so-called fool Khan will be assigned to defend them you should then divide the army under your command in two but be very careful to avoid being detected or recognized by enemy units on the lookout for ambushes so you will not be ambushed by them instead remain in your hiding place until the 11th hour of the day when the sun is already setting if the falcon returns as it usually does to those settlements in which their comrades are encamped then send to those distant villages the troops you dispatched earlier with yourself following behind and staying close to them as the lay of the land permits keep advancing secretly without loud shouting and stay concealed until you get very close to the villages when you can no longer keep your men hidden by following a stream but have to come out into the open then have the troops you had dispatched earlier make a charge with fresh horses against the enemy in the villages by attacking them unexpectedly, you will kill many, and you will take others alive as captives. But if the falcon supposed to defend them is still in position outside the settlements, then have the troops dispatched earlier, as El said. First make the charge against it around sunset. You follow along behind your advance party, all drawn up to launch an attack, then charge against them, and by the favor of Christ you will defeat them. But if the enemy commanders present there have a large force, they may be able to hold their ground and will struggle to come back from defeat, which is impossible. For with night already falling, nothing untoward will happen to you. If therefore you do things in this manner, the enemy will be amazed and terrified of you, and they will not dare to ride away from their army without fear. Finally, the lack of food will force them to return to their own country. 23. Retreat of the enemy and occupation of the mountain passes. When the enemy are withdrawing and are hastening to reach their own country, our infantry forces should be dispatched beforehand to the mountain passes to hold the roads along which they will be passing. The road which they may plan on taking might lead from the passes in Seleucia and the theme of Anatolicon, up to the Taurus Mountains which border on Cilicia, as well as Cappadocia and Lycandos. In addition, there are the regions about Germanicaea and Adata, also Kaisun, Danutha, Melitene, and Caludia, and the regions beyond the Euphrates River bordering on the country called Chanzeti and the hostile territory as far as Romanopolis. In all of these themes then, along whichever road the enemy may wish to pass in returning to their own land, rely on God's help. Do not hesitate at all. Quickly make your arrangements to attack them, and by God's favor you will find victory. When you are four stations or campsites away and know the road along which the enemy are marching, it is your duty as leader of the whole army to get in front of them right away, and join up with the infantry forces you had dispatched to the mountain passes. Leave the best of the other generals behind to ride after them to deal with their raids and forays to the rear. Keep the rest of the cavalry force with yourself under your command. Arrange things in such a way that when the enemy get to about two days' march from the pass, then you and your entire army should march through and arrive at the place in which preparations are being made for the battle against them. Now when you get to the pass and join up with the infantry units, you must be sure to assemble another force, mostly infantry and as large as possible. In eloquent language exhort them, urge them on to bravery and boldness, stir up their enthusiasm. As a perfect general, address them with honeyed words. Roman men, let us stand steadfast and unswerving. Let us stand in a manly and noble fashion. Let us show the enemy our arm and our strength. Let us show them that they are attacking stronger men, that they are drawn up facing men who will strike rather than be struck. For they are not made of stone or bronze which cannot be wounded nor is their body of iron which does not break down under exertion and which feels nothing. In addition, point out to them the rugged terrain in which they will soon be getting set for combat and how much it works to their advantage. After you have incited and aroused them and made them more eager and daring, have them proceed to their battle stations to await the enemy. First, occupy the high points of the mountains. Hold and secure all the roads. On those in which cavalry are able to fight alongside the infantry, find a place for them too. 
You must put your best officers in command of each of your units, and you must observe and put into practice all the other things we set forth in the beginning of this book about fighting the enemy in difficult country. When the enemy draw near, they will notice the security measures you have taken on the road and realize that there is no way to pass through. But if they dare to take such a risk, that decision will not produce good results for them. They will be cut down and throttled by your people. They will be forced to tumtail and lace back to get to their own country by another road. As they retreat in great disgrace and disorder, your men will look on them and be filled with joy and gladness of heart, impossible to describe in words. Now then, when the enemy are retreating, as has been said, follow along behind them. Send horsemen on ahead together with fast light troops. You should quicken your own pace and hurry to catch up with them. In their flight, they will try to get through the difficult areas quickly and steer clear of any fighting as they try to reach their own country. When they draw closer to the mountain pass, they become apprehensive about the infantry units getting in front of them again and blocking their route, and they may attempt to travel at night. If so, you should overtake them quickly, for their horses will be worn out from the long march, and the men will be exhausted from having to journey at night. You will find, General, what you have always yearned for. When you catch up with them at night, you should immediately make an attack on what is called the Saka with your infantry, and then have the horsemen join in after them. Dispatch other light troops with cavalry to station themselves on both sides of the road ahead of the enemy, and order them to mount an attack from the side. If you do all this, they will not be able to resist, but will rush into flight. If they do so at night, pursue them, and you will annihilate them. 24. Fighting at night. If the enemy should form another plan which they hope will work to their advantage, once they become aware of your presence, that night they will pitch their tents and set up camp. Then you should attack them at night, making sure to prepare the assault as explained. You should launch your attack from the rear with infantry units. Divide the remaining infantry into six divisions. Station three off to the right side of the enemy, and three off to the left. If the nature of the ground requires that their camp be set up in an extended way, they should be about a bow shot apart, or a little less. Leave open and unguarded the road, and that alone, which provides safe passage for the enemy toward their own land. After they have been vigorously assaulted, and they discover the open road, beguiled by the idea of being saved, of fleeing the battle, and of getting back to their own land, they mount their horses and race along that road to escape, each man concerned only about his own safety. If they have not set up their camp in an extended way, but have been compelled by the nature of the ground to make it in a circle, you must form your infantry units in a circle around it and get them ready for battle. Be sure, as we mentioned, to leave only that one road free and open which leads to their own country. After you have drawn up your foot soldiers in this manner, have the units set up camp close to the enemy and light a large number of fires. Over each one of the infantry units station a brave and competent officer. Each unit should also be accompanied by some horsemen under outstanding officers stationed to the rear, as space allows. You should also order all the infantry troops to obey them. When preparations have been made in this manner, pick out some brave and fleet-footed light-armed troops and send them ahead. They should silently move up as close as possible to the enemy. Give orders that those stationed in the middle are to lead the attack, then the troops in front. If the ground rises higher on both sides, have the infantry attack the enemy from both directions, as the enemy are struck by stones hurled by hand or slings or arrows from above on both sides. They will quickly fall apart. If the nature of the ground is not such but rises up only on one side, in like manner it is easier to have them hurl rocks and shoot arrows against them from that direction. If the fighting is on level ground though, it is necessary to exercise greater care. If the enemy want to mount their horses and charge against our light-armed troops, they will not cause them any serious harm, because the terrain will help them. But rather, they will inflict great damage upon themselves. Have all the infantry units descend from both directions, and have all the trumpets sounded, and raise a shout and battle cry. Then the general coming up from the rear should join battle with all his strength. If the enemy still hold out and do not dash into flight, then the fast light troops and the ones who had been sent out ahead should be aroused by their officers to go into the tents of the enemy. The rugged terrain will make this easy for them. When they start taking the enemy's horses, mules and other belongings, and start taking men captive, when this son of thing begins, they will all rush in to join in the pillaging. They will go through the tents sparing nobody, cutting them down with the sword. Then the enemy will rush to escape. The ones who can do so will mount their horses, and others will be on foot as they try to hide and find safety in the mountains and ravines. If such is the end of the battle, it should be ascribed to the help of God through the intercession of his undefiled mother, the Theotokos, 
glory will accrue to the holy emperors, and the whole Roman army will gain in power, for the enemy are unable to stand up and face them. At break of day they might come to some level ground, halt for a rest there, and pitch their tents. But since such a place is not at all suitable for launching an attack at night, the general should take all his infantry and cavalry and again move in front of them. He should occupy the mountain heights and also secure the road passing through. And since all the roads, as we said, leading to the enemy's country through all the themes which we have listed and which we have seen with our own eyes are difficult to travel, being in the mountains which form the frontier between both countries, hasten to seize the passes before they do, and without delay, launch your attack directly against them. By the grace of Christ our God you will overpower them, hurl them down, and annihilate them. 25. Another method of occupying the road and making descent difficult. It may indeed happen that the road along which they are retreating leads from higher up down to the enemy and becomes level without any difficulty sections in which to confront them directly. But it may also slope downward, become narrow and rough, confusing their formations, not allowing more than a few men to pass through at a time, and making the others wait to pass through in their tum. In these narrow places the infantry units ought to be stationed on either side of the enemy, two on the right and two on the left, separated from one another. To the rear, however, station an ambuscade composed of foot soldiers with some horsemen and a brave and very experienced officer, especially if they leave what is called a sokka further up to stand and guard the road, but not close, so they will not be recognized. If the men stationed in the ambuscade further up are eager to engage in battle, when our units stationed down below make their attack against the enemy passing through up ahead, let the men stationed in the ambuscade, foot and horse, also move out and join them in fighting against the enemy. But if the men in the ambuscade are not bold enough to go down and attack the Saka, which is located on level ground, they can stay on in the ambush. And when it hurries down to pass through and join up with its own people, for it is not possible for it to remain there for long, when it gets on the mad leading downward, then have the men in the ambush charge out. They should occupy the road and charge against them from above. The enemy will not be able to resist or defend themselves under attack, the location it's if being against them, but they will hurry to rejoin their own people as they are attacked in the narrow passes by our units stationed below. They will hope to get through and arrive in their own land, but they will never make it if the combat has in fact been prepared as we have proposed. Rather, they will be thoroughly defeated by our God who is true, to whom be the glory and the power, with the Son and the Holy Spirit now and forever and for the ages of ages. Amen. With God's help, the end of the tactics.